111. Come we that love the Lord and let our joys be known. Join in a song with sweet accord. Join in a song with sweet accord. And thus around the throne and thus around the throne. We're marching to Zion. Beautiful, beautiful Zion. We're marching upward to Zion, the beautiful city of God. Let those refuse to sing who never knew our God. But children of the heavenly King, but children of the heavenly King may speak their joys abroad, may speak their joys abroad. We're marching to Zion, beautiful, beautiful Zion. We're marching upward to Zion, the beautiful city of God. The hill of Zion yields a thousand sacred sweets. Before we reach the heavenly fields, before we reach the heavenly field, or walk the golden street, or walk the golden street. We're marching to Zion, beautiful, beautiful Zion. We're marching upward to Zion, the beautiful city of God. Then let our songs abound and every tear be dry. We're marching through Emmanuel's ground. We're marching through Emmanuel's ground to fairer worlds on high, to fairer worlds on high. We're marching to Zion, beautiful, beautiful Zion. We're marching upward to Zion, the beautiful city of God. Five hundred. Five hundred. Oh, the fount of every blessing, to my heart to sing thy praise. Streams of mercy never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me ever to adore thee, may I still thy goodness prove. While the hope of endless glory fills my heart with joy and love. Here I raise my Ebenezer, hither by thy help I come, and I hope by thy good pleasure safely to arrive at home. Jesus sought me when a stranger, wandering from the fold of God, he to rescue me from danger interposed his precious blood. Oh, to grace, how great a debtor, daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy goodness, like a better, find my wandering heart to thee. Never let me wander from thee, never leave the God I love. Here's my heart, oh, take and seal it, seal it for thy courts above. Would you please mark 744. 7.44. And before I forget, I didn't do this this morning. I did it to them personally, but I do want to thank Brianna and Adele and everybody that tried to get things to go working last week. Uh, the one thing that I know about being around here and the one thing I know about technology, that means that it's also somewhere else, is that technology doesn't always work the way you want it to. And uh, they got in there and, and got it to working, and so I'm glad, to, and I want to thank them publicly for that. Number two, next Sunday night is potluck, and so make plans to be here for that after church on Sunday night. We're, we're kind of oddballs around here. Somebody asked me, what, or said to me one time, said, uh, I don't believe in organized religion. I said, well, come visit with us. We're the most unorganized people you've ever seen in your life. And uh, he didn't believe me, but uh, it's true. Would you please take your Bibles and turn to 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1. I don't know what you would put in this series of lessons 
There are over 7,000 of them. We can't get to all 7,000 of them unless we spent the next maybe 15 years talking about the promises of God. The promises of God are so, so precious and so important. In fact, Peter says in 2 Peter 1 and verse number 4, He has given to us exceedingly great and precious promises. He has given to us exceedingly great and precious promises. And one of those promises I got introduced to a few weeks ago, a couple of weeks ago, by David Sproul, who preaches at Balmy Lakes Congregation. You see, it wasn't but about maybe 12, 13 years old, maybe just a little older. And he said his grandpa, who he revered, who he just thought the world of, was battling a health problem. And he said that he walked in to his grandpa's room and his grandpa was taking a nap. But he had it exposed to Psalm, or excuse me, Isaiah 41 and verse number 10. He said, I didn't know why he had it exposed to Psalm Isaiah 41 and verse 10. And he said, so I snuck it from my grandpa and I read it and he said, that has become for him one of his favorite memory verses. And it is based on a promise God has made. I know the answer to this question tonight, so I'm going to ask it anyway with the idea that I already know. Has anybody ever broke a promise you to you? Has anybody ever broke a promise you made or broke your trust in that promise? And you can't bank on that promise. I was telling some people that I had somebody tell me that I will be at your room on Monday and I will show you how to, how to teach things. And I just, okay, great, wonderful. I have yet to see the man in my room. There are other people that have told me they're going to do things and, and they're, going to, they're going to keep their promise only to realize they're not going to keep their promise. Well, I promise you tonight, with every fiber of my being, God always keeps his promises. Some of those promises we are not going to like. Most of those promises we are going to enjoy. And this one, we're going to like an awful lot. So if you look with me as Isaiah 41, and verse number 10. God says, fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. You look at that promise, and on the one level you say, well, yeah, he's God. He can do anything. No, God cannot do anything. What did you just say? Kenneth Dwayne Springer, I ought to wash your mouth out with soap. No, God can't do anything. God cannot lie. That is 1 and verse 2. God cannot be faithless. 2 Timothy 2.13. So there are things God cannot do. But God, on the one level, can do anything. In fact, I remember one of my favorite songs. My God is so big, so strong, and so mighty. There's nothing my God cannot do. And come to find out, yeah, there's things God cannot do. But as far as his strength and his power, we just know, all right, they're synonymous. They, they just go together. But how about on the deeper level? When you begin to look at life and you begin to look at things, you begin to look at the troubles you got and look at the problems you got and look at the things that you have, and, and, and all of a sudden, it's like you, you, you figure out quickly why David wrote the Psalms the way he did. <laughs> and what we need to do is we need to go through this. 
and remind ourselves what God said. Now, here's why I love Isaiah. Isaiah has been called the Romans of the Old Testament. The first 39 chapters have to do with gloom and doom. Unless people repent, that's the hope within the first 39 chapters. But he knew what was going to happen. God knew what was going to take place. The second 27 chapters have to do with the remnant, have to do with the great news. And so when he says, when he says the things that he says in chapters 40 through 66, now don't panic, we're not going to go through all of that tonight. We're just going to stay right here with some supplemental material. The first thing we need to understand is the most repetitive command in all of the Bible is that one right there. Do not be afraid. Do not fear. Do not be afraid. That's the most command. That's the most repetitive command in all of God's word. You would have thought maybe it had been God loves. You would have thought maybe I love you. No, the most repetitive command is do not be afraid. How many times did he tell Joshua in chapter 1, in the time it takes you to read it, maybe two minutes, how many times did he say that very phrase three times? Because you've got to understand, I've got to understand, he's following the only leader Israel ever had. Who, to whom are they going to compare Joshua? They're always going to compare him to Moses. Floyd followed a great preacher. They both go on to their reward. But I would laugh because our next door neighbor who was a member of the church, his name, the man's name was Osborne. And, and, and yet she never called him Osborne. She always called him Orsborne. And finally, after six weeks of listening to people say, well, that's not the way Brother Orsburn would do it. That's not, he finally got up and he said, brethren, he said, I want you to know I love you very, very much. But he said, I want you to know something. I'm not Bill Osborn. And people would go, well, yeah, that's right. Bill served for 10 years and Floyd served for seven. And, and, and you would look and, and there would be things Floyd would do it and you just, man, I didn't think he was afraid of anything. One time he changed the light fixture, a light switch at Granny's house without turning the electricity off. I said, are you sure you know what you're doing? <laughs> he said, yeah, I'll be fine. I saw a spark or two. I didn't want to let him know that I saw it. But don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Isn't it interesting how we have been so afraid in most of our lives in one form or another? Don't be afraid of the dark. Look at what happens when the dark, the boogeyman, comes out. Look, look what happens. And, and I hated horror films until I went to see A Nightmare on Elm Street Part 3 and I got hooked. Man, I want to see horror films nearly all the time. And people go, are you crazy? Are you nuts? And I love to scare people and, and get that adrenaline going just a little bit. The worst movie I've ever seen is Pieces and the worst scary movie was phantasm. I don't know where they found Angus Scrim, but boy, he's something else. He played that part well. And yet, we still don't listen to the commands of God, do we? Psalm 118, verse 6, the Lord's on whose side? Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to tell you with these scriptures here that we're entitled to God being on our side, but the thing is if we're on God's side Romans 8 31 then it stands to reason whose side are we on? Whose side are we standing? The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Isn't that what Jesus said in Matthew 10 28 and 29? Do not fear the one who can destroy the body but cannot destroy the soul. But you better fear the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Don't listen to members of the church, and I'm gonna I'm gonna be blunt here, but don't listen to members of the church when they condemn you for saying the reason you obey the gospel is you didn't want to go to hell. Folks, that's the main reason I obeyed the gospel. Because I knew what the scriptures taught. 
Have I learned things since? Oh, absolutely. Does God love me? If you didn't believe me, go back and look at the lesson this morning on YouTube. I mean, if God is so interested, does he love, does he care, is he concerned? You better believe it. He is very concerned about us. Hebrews 13, 6, I'll, I'll never leave you. The Lord is my helper. What can man do to me? You can continue through this. And he said in Revelation 2, 10, do not fear any of the things which you're about to suffer. Indeed, the devil will throw some of you into prison and you'll have tribulation ten days, but be faithful to death and I'll give you the crown of life. I have a special affinity for that verse. And if you want to know later, I'll tell you. But all that's wrapped up in 1 John 4, 18. What casts out fear? It's that four-letter word we have trouble with. L. O V E. Don't fear. Don't be afraid because number two, I am your God. Now I capitalized I am because I want you to go back to Exodus chapter 3, verse number 14. If there, were, if there was one Old Testament prophet that I think I'd be best friends with, it would be Moses. First of all, who am I? I mean, who am I? I'm, I, I, I updated it for me personally. I'm just an old boy from Southwest Oklahoma, the oldest of four kids. And, 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 you know, when people hear me talk, they're like Jeff Foxworthy. They lower my IQ by 300 points. And he says, but, and then I think about what Jeff Foxworthy said. Well, I don't think about it. You're, you're a surgeon and you're standing over somebody and it says, well, what we're going to do is we're going to rip you open. We're going to rip that sucker out of there and slap you back together. Yeah, I kind of get nervous about the way he talks, too. And, and, and I'm, I'm nothing. And in chapters 3 and 4, Moses tries everything he can to get out of this assignment. It's a simple assignment. It's an assignment that God didn't tell him all the details. You see, he ran from Pharaoh because there was a death hit on him. And for 40 years he enjoyed living in the land of Midian until he saw that burning bush, that bush that never consumed was burning. And he had to go see what it was and his wife was battering an old wet hen as we'd say at home because she went to, he went to go see it. And then, take your sandals off, the place you stand is holy ground. Well, what, who made it holy? God did. And then he says, all I want you to do is I want you to go back to Egypt, tell Pharaoh, let my people go three days journey in the wilderness, but he's not going to let you go. I know, but I'm going to be with you. I am going to be right there, and I'm going to fight, and you're going to bring that people that are in Egypt right back to this place. <laughs> now, you don't read the laughter, I know, but that's what you must have been doing. Uh, uh. Oh, you got the wrong guy. You got the wrong guy. I can't talk. I, 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 I can't do this. What am I going to say when I get there? That's a valid one sometimes. Have you ever got up in front of people and you what got stage fright? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, what am I going to tell them when I get there? And then God does the greatest thing. He says, what's that in your hand? And he said, a staff, a rod. He said, put it on the ground. It became a snake. And it became a fierce snake so much that Moses went and hid from it. And then God asked him to do the impossible. <laughs> I say the impossible because when, when I ask people, would you pick up the snake? They go, no way. Kill the thing first. He said, pick it up by the tail. And it became a rod again. And then in verse 14, he says, If they won't listen to you, then tell them the I am that I am sent you. Well, they knew who the I am was. Remember Jesus made a man in John 8, 58? Abraham lived to see my day. You're not yet 50 years old. And what do you mean Abraham lived to see my day? He said, before Abraham was, I am. They went to go stone him to death. Jesus just walked right through them. 
that will win this time. Now, what does he say in Matthew 7, 21 to 23? There are a lot of people that do a lot of talking. I preached a lesson one time on this, that, and I still say it from time to time. God's not interested in just our talking. Our talking sounds mighty good. In fact, that's the point of the Sermon on the Mount, isn't it? <laughs> isn't Matthew 23 just about what it appears to be to people? He's interested in our walk. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord. Now, what? For you and me, that doesn't mean anything. I mean, yeah, Lord is one thing. Yes, we know who the Lord is. But why would he? Because the Pharisees said, the, law, the scribes said, you had to say, Lord, Lord, to talk about the Lord. And so he says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. And they turn around and say, wait a minute. Wait a minute. How can you talk like that? Have a, I mean, look at all the things that we have done for you. We, we cast out demons. We, we've done miracles. We, we've done all those things that you would approve of. And Jesus says it, and King James says it the best. He said, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. I can only imagine what those five foolish virgins must have felt when they went to town to buy oil because they weren't prepared for the delay. And the bridegroom shuts the door on them telling them, I never knew you. Acts 9, four, verses 4 and 5. Talk about a radical change. I, I want to write some type of paper on this guy. Not because nobody else has done it before, but specifically this one right here in Acts, verse, Acts chapter 9, verses 4 and 5. This is the guy. We call him Saul. Now his name is Paul because he was the preacher to the Gentiles. He's the one who stood by consenting to Stephen's death. He is the one who is wreaking havoc of the church. He is the one that's trying to tear up the church. And he knows Jesus is nothing but a lunatic. He knows he's a legend, but he's nothing but a liar. But watch what happens in Acts 9, verse 4 and 5. All of a sudden, this bright light shines. And a voice comes out and says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And Saul goes, who's that? Uh-uh. Who's talking? Uh-uh. Who are you, Lord? Who are you, Lord? And imagine Saul's face. I, I wish Dr. Luke was allowed to tell us his face. Because when he heard I am Jesus of Nazareth whom you are persecuting. Don't you know it is hard for you to kick against the goads or the King James would call it the pricks. He was killing himself. Because what, the, what was designed was when that ox would kick back, it would kick into one of those gourds, one of those goads, one of those pricks. And the ox has a major blood, blood vein. And when they kick that, it just start bleeding and bleeding. Jesus said, that's what you're doing. You're killing yourself. And when somebody tells you that the Lord told me how to obey the gospel, respectfully speaking, don't believe them. Don't believe them. Why do I say that? Because if you'll read the rest of the text, he says, go to the street, call straight, and it will be told you what you need to do. Oh, can you imagine the next character, Ananias? You imagine him coming from the Lord, and even the Lord couldn't convince him much. I want you to go to the street called Straight, and I want you to tell Saul what he needs to do in order to be saved. Uh, Lord, uh... <laughs> 
I've heard a lot of things about this guy. I've heard a lot of things that said, go, for he's a chosen vessel of mine, verse 15. And Paul said that when he walked in, Ananias said, said that he was blind for three days, and when Ananias said, receive your sight, it was something like scales fell from his eyes. And Ananias asked him the question, why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized, wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. I have friends of mine who tell me that baptism is not essential for salvation. And I show them this one right here. Then why didn't he even say, why are you waiting? Why are you waiting? Romans 7.25, who's going to save us from this wretched body of death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. I am your God. Now, here's the problem for us, and I'll illustrate it so well by using one of my favorite stores, Walmart. Do you know Sam Walton was, is a member of the church? He is a member of the church. He's gone on to his reward. But it was so funny how he started that store. He asked his cousin who lived in a place that I preached, go into business with me. And his cousin said, well, what are you going to do? He said, I'm going to run a five and dime store. He said, what are you going to call it? He said, I'm going to call it Walmart. His cousin laughed him to scorn. May I ask you who the number one retailer in the world is today, folks? with annual sales between 786 billion and 1 trillion dollars. And when when uh, when he built that store, he did his homework. He's the first one to ever put anything on the way through the checkout. This is why I'm convinced the pharmacy is told and I say it with all due respect to pharmacists that they tell you that it'll be anywhere between 20 and 30 minutes before you get your medicine so you can go buy stuff in the store. He's the first one to put anything at the checkout line. I used to read the tabloids for a few seconds just to see what they were being stupid about. Kids don't even know what tabloids are today. And then he did something else. And I'm going to ask you another question. You don't have to answer it. How many of you have ever been to Walmart and you know where something is and you go over there the next week and you can't find it? Because, because Mr. Walton did his homework. <coughs> Mr. Walton learned quickly, if you don't move it, you will lose it. It will not sell. And I should have known it. My granny, who I revered, who was one step below God, said, don't move anything in my bedroom. I moved something, one, I'm not kidding, I moved it this far. I got the chewing out of my life because my granny couldn't find it. And I shouldn't have done it. But you know me, I'm mock. God doesn't move. We're the ones who move. And unfortunately, sometimes we can't see God. What did Peter do in Matthew 14? Here is Jesus. Did he go anywhere? When, when Peter said, Lord, if it's you permit me to come to you, did he move? No. And Peter was walking on the water in the midst of all that tumultuous stuff. It didn't die down. I always thought it did. It didn't. And you know when he started sinking? It's when he paid attention to what was going on around him. Did Jesus go anywhere? No. But he knew where Jesus was. Because when he began to sink, what is it he began to ask? Lord, save me. And the Lord reached out, picked him up, put him in the boat. And he asked that awful question we all need to hear. Awful because we don't like it. It hurts. But it's so necessary. Why? Why did you doubt, O oh, you of little faith?
Mark says, oh, you of no faith. Ouch. I'll strengthen you. And I'm telling you, Psalm 31, 24, be of good courage and he'll strengthen your heart. All who hope in the Lord. Oh, I can read this. But sometimes it's hard for me to get it in my whole heart. The Lord will strengthen you. The Lord will strengthen you. 2 Timothy 4, 17, when Paul was there in his, by himself, only the Lord was with him. He said, what happens? They said, the Lord strengthened me. He stood with me. That's why he warned Timothy, don't let Alexander the coppersmith get it to you because he did a lot of harmful things to me. But what did, he, what did he say? It was so beautiful what he said. But I delivered him to whom? The Lord. The Lord will do that. First Peter 5.10, the Lord will strengthen us. Now here's what we tend to do. And we don't want to admit this, but I'm going to be honest. You know, oh, I know the Lord will strengthen Somebody will suggest you spend time with the Lord in prayer. Uh, somebody wasn't a Christian a while back told me, he said, well, have you ever prayed about it? Honey, I'm a Christian. Honey, I'm a preacher. What do you think I've been doing about this? There's sometimes I'll spend 30, 45 minutes talking about the same thing, and, and then I get to thinking, oh, God doesn't want to listen to me whine and complain. Oh, well, let me tell you what. God's got all the time in the world for me. God's got all the time in the world for his children. Don't ever forget that. God is God. I love hope. We were coming home one night from Altus. My cousin, who I thank the world of, all of a sudden she just got real sleepy and she put her head on my shoulder and all of a sudden you hear this Now, did I go, boom, get off of me? No. She wasn't but about nine years old. I loved every minute of it. Why do we think God tries to bump us off? I will uphold you. The arms of the wicked will be broken, but the Lord upholds the righteous. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and behold me by your generous spirit. And then Hebrews 1.3 just floors us. English doesn't give it right. The New International got it the closest, but it still doesn't do it right. And what he, what Hebrews 1, 3 says, if you could take God, stand him right here, and you took a mirror of God and, and had God in the mirror and Jesus stand there, there is no difference. It's just like transform the, the, the transform the transition in our morph transition in PowerPoint. You can't see the difference. It's amazing, but what is it about this Jesus? What is it about this Jesus? Go to Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14. Hebrews 4, verse 14. This Jesus, this God is going to uphold us. How? Now, I don't want to belabor a point, but from time to time I do, since I've been here so long, I do try to remind you of things. A few years ago, and she's still around, very successful, there was a pop singer by the name of Madonna. When she got to Motown or got to Detroit, she had $31 in her pocket. Needless to say, she's got more than $31 in her pocket now. And she came out with a song that she knew what religious people were going to do. She knew what religious people were going to do. The song was called Life of Prayer. And she first of all suggested that Jesus was tempted by a woman. <clears throat> she suggested second of all that Jesus was tempted by Mary Magdalene because there are some religious people that will teach you today that Jesus and Mary Magdalene were married. That is not true. That Jesus was wanting to do things with this woman that he shouldn't have. And, P, and I'm telling you, she hit a home run. That prayer, or that song, wouldn't have been worth two cents had, had religious people not helped her. 
And friends of mine would say, well, didn't you get offended at the song? And I went, no. Well, I got offended at the song, and I don't even go to church. I said, what'd you get offended about? She said, Madonna said Jesus was tempted. Really? Would you look at Hebrews 4.14? We do not have a high priest who cannot but sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in how many points tempted? All points tempted, yet without sin. Verse 15. Seeing then, verse 14, we have a high, high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus Christ the righteous. Do you know he knows what it's like to be tempted? He knows what it's like to be a human being. He was one. It's the only way he could save mankind. And what does he say in verse 16? And my friends just looked at me shocked that I wasn't offended. Jesus was tempted. Whether it was Mary Magdalene, whether it was whatever, he was tempted in every point in the world. Yet without sin. So what do we get to do? My dad used to pray a prayer. And I know you get in a repetition of things. And he'd say, we approach your throne of grace with boldness. And I go, never heard that. Where do you get that? Hebrews 4.16. Let us, therefore, let us. God's not going to force you. God's not going to force me. Let us, therefore, come to the throne of grace. Nope. That isn't what he said. Oh, come on. You don't honestly. Do, do you know what kind of life I've lived? Do, do you know what kind of, a, of an individual I've been? Not really. And I'm sorry if this sounds blunt, but I don't care. I don't care what kind of life you live. My cousin used to pull that on me. He would say something like this. He'd say, and I'd try to get him to come back to church, and he'd say, well, you know what kind of sinner I am. And I'd let him talk for about five minutes. And then I'd tell him, well, have you ever murdered a Christian? What? I said, have you ever murdered a Christian? And he'd go, well, that's a stupid question, Dwayne. I've never done that before. Really? He said, where did you get, what, what kind of question is that? I said, you're not as bad as the Apostle Paul. He stood by consenting to the death of Stephen, a Christian. He wreaked havoc of the church. And yet, who do we, who do most Christians think is one step below Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, and God Almighty? The Apostle Paul. He is the only one I know of that we traditionally call the Apostle. Even though Peter was and John was. And I'm not trying to, de to demean anything from Paul. But Paul got it. We don't sometimes. You thought I went away from verse 16, didn't you? Let us therefore come, how? Boldly. To the throne of grace that we might find mercy and watch this and help in our time of need well I don't feel like God helps me much I don't feel like God's merciful I don't you're breathing aren't you did you eat lunch today did you drink coffee this morning did you drink iced tea for lunch like me? Did you get to take a little nap today? Do you live in the greatest country in the world? God hasn't ended things, has he? God didn't zap you, did he? And if you're like me, there were enough things last week that he could have zapped you for by Monday of last week. See, my faith got weak. I wanted to give up. 
I wanted to give up everything. Even my own life until I realized again, as we said this morning, my life doesn't belong to me. What does Galatians 2.20 say? I've been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. In the life I live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me <coughs> and gave himself for me. I will be with you. Years ago, I knew what I needed to do. And yet what was harder for me to do was to go forward after I had obeyed the gospel than it was before. My dad told me one of the greatest things I've ever heard in my life. He says, there's not a thing I can't tell you you don't already, need, already know what you need to do. But I knew another time I needed to go and there's this force. There's this force holding you back Oh, do you know what people would think if you did this? Do you know what people would think if you... Oh, my golly. Well, I fought through it. And yet, those other times I've listened to the devil saying, No, no, no. you got to get covered. You know what? The question comes up, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? Because what he wants first all to go home I don't know what heaven's going to sound like but I want to go I want to sing I want to sing tenor, alto, bass I don't care what it is but my grandma's words still reverberate in my mind the last words she said I want to go home and she's on her way this evening if you're here we're going to sing 744 as a means of encouragement this evening. If there's something we can help you with, let us know as we sing. Someday you'll stand at the bar on high. Someday your record you'll see. Someday you'll answer the question of life. What will your answer be? What will it be? What will it be? What will it be? What will it be? Where will you spend your eternity? What will it be? Oh, what will it be? What will your answer be? Now is the time to prepare, my friend. Make your soul spotless and free. Washed in the blood of the crucified one, he will your answer be. What will it be? What will it be? Where will you spend your eternity? What will it be? Oh, what will it be? What will your answer be? 
for that great institution, that memorial, which brings to our minds that broken body. When Jesus took that bread, he divided it amongst the disciples, gave thanks, and said, Take, eat, this is my body broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. Be with the ones partaking tonight, Father, but help us all to remember how fortunate we are. It is in Jesus we pray. Father, we continue thanks for what's in the cup. Jesus said is his blood. The fruit of the vine that he took, he drank from the first two cups, and the third cup is the one which we get to drink. It's that cup of redemption. And we look forward to that fourth cup when we drink it anew, when your kingdom finally is completely together from all over the world. When Jesus, or when the angels take those that are his and take them home. What a song of delight that's going to be. What a day that will be. Father, we pray you'll be with the ones partaking tonight, Father, but help us all to remember that Jesus told us if we do not eat his flesh and drink his blood, we have no part of him. In Jesus we pray. Amen. Eight hundred sixty-three. Eight hundred sixty-three. I'm going to ask Patrick to dismiss us in prayer after this song. Before we do that, I just want to remind you: this Wednesday we'll be talking about Hey Guy, one of my favorite books. It's not Hey Guy. Hey Guy is the name of the book. And uh, well, that went over like a lead balloon. Sorry. And the other is uh, Sunday night. Next Sunday night is. Uh, potluck. We'll meet here at 6.30 for uh, the Wednesday night Bible study and then we'll have a regular service next week. We are trying, I do want you to know, we're trying to work out a schedule where we can get Bible study back. We are not anti-Bible school. We're not one of those congregations among the churches of Christ that hate Bible study, but trying to work out the logistics so everybody can get here. Uh, we, we may... Um, but we're going to work on that. That's one of my goals this year. All right. 863. I love you with the love of the Lord. I love you with the love of the Lord. I see in you the glory of my King. And I love you with the love of the Lord. Please love me with the love of the Lord. Please love me with the love of the Lord. I see in you the glory of my King, and I love you with the love of the Lord. Heavenly Father, so many things as I look back in my life that I forgot that you were there. I didn't, I wasn't a good Christian, Father. So many times I would worry about things that as I look back, all those things never came to pass, not one time. But yet I, I never called on your name, Father. I never called and said, Father, what fear is, is the devil trying to take advantage of us? Father, like it says in First Peter, he was like a roaring lion roaming the earth, seeing whom he may devour. And fear is one of those things that, Father, I think he uses. Father, kick us in the side. Kick us hard in the side. Remind us that there with us that we so easily forget we are so easily forget that you're there and no matter really what happens is we have a way to go home father that your son showed us so 
Father. I ask again that you just kick us in the side, Father. Let us know you're there. Father, remind us to be in your word, even if it's five minutes a day, but every day. It's a, a good habit to be in, Father. So, Father, again, thank you for your son. Thank you for what he did on the cross. Father, we pray all these things and so many more in your son's name, Jesus. Amen. And thank you for being here tonight. Thank you.